Awesome. Awesome. We got it started. All right. So uh, let's pick up where we left off last week on page 60. And uh, so what we did last week was we read through and we broke down how it works. And, um, and so what we're doing is, is we're laying down the foundation for step three. And, uh, and that's where we're picking up today. So what we left off on was the three pertinent ideas. And we'll, we'll uh, start our formal reading at being convinced we were at step three. But just to kind of borrow from what we read last week, those three pertinent ideas are laying down the foundation of steps one and steps two. So just to do a very quick review, uh, the first pertinent idea, A, that we were alcoholics and could not manage our own lives, that's a first step proposition, that I am an alcoholic, I cannot manage my life. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism, again, that is a step one proposition. I know we like to go step one, two, three, but it's a step one proposition because if a human power could have relieved me of my alcoholism, I wouldn't have to make this third step decision. I could, I could go do other things, you know, and I sure as heck wouldn't have to follow that decision up with action. And the, uh, then what we have is the C, that God could and would if he were sought. And that is our step two um, proposition, our step two idea, that God can and that God will. And so we have to be convinced of those things. And if we can be convinced, understanding, hey, that I'm an alcoholic. And just for those that are just joining, that are new to the study, just very quickly, what it means to be an alcoholic is when I drink, I do not have the ability to control the amount I take every single time. Or if when I honestly want to, and I've said those, the Alcoholics National Anthem, that I'm never going to drink again, that that has no effect in the long term, that I haven't been able to stay sober. That's all that makes an alcoholic. So it's just being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that? And what do we do? And I know when I got here, I was kind of confused about the third step. I was a little like, how do I turn my will and my life over? Am I supposed to do that now? I don't really understand this God thing. In the second step, I just admitted that I was willing to believe, you know, and so I overthought it and I overcomplicated it. So to make it really, really, really simple, the third step is just a decision. And man, I should not say just because it's a pretty big decision, but it is a decision to work those steps, those steps that we read on page 58. And to do it a little like our life depends on it, because if I'm an alcoholic, it does, right? So the third step is just a decision to work the rest of the steps. And in so doing, in taking those steps, our will and our life gets turned over. That's what we're doing. And uh, for those that maybe have been, um, you know, kind of known me a little while, we often do the, the three frogs sitting on a log, right? There's that saying, all right, we got three frogs and they're sitting on a log. And one of them makes a decision to jump off the log. How many, fr how many frogs? I was going to say friends. I went, I love those little guys. Uh, how many frogs that I've become emotionally attached to? So don't leave me. How many frogs are sitting on that log? And the answer is three. Exactly. Yeah, three. Because that frog made a decision. He has not followed it up with action. And so that's what we're doing here is we're making that decision. And I, I had the privilege of um, going out of town this weekend and, and I was flying out to Fort McMurray and it was wonderful time, a wonderful experience. And, uh, and I was called before that to Paige, will you come to Fort McMurray? And in that moment, I was asked whether or not to make a decision, right? Whether or not I would go to Fort McMurray. I made my decision. And I didn't get there. I didn't poof magically I'm in Fort McMurray. There was some stuff that I had to do, right? I had to book tickets. I had to get to the airport. I had to get through security. I had to, you know, get to the terminal. I had to get on the plane, right? Those were the actions that I had to take to get me to Fort McMurray. And so it is a decision 
to go to that place of spiritual awakening and a decision to do the work that is required, but I haven't done the work yet. But to make that decision, because I don't know about you guys, when I looked at the steps, I was a little like, I don't know about all of those. You know, I got some opinions on some of those and I got some not, not too keen about all of them, right? I had some of that. And so to make that decision, there are some requirements that I, I need to be convinced of. So we go on to the bottom of page 60 for those who have uh, just joined us. It says the very bottom paragraph, the first requirement. So this is something that is required of me to make this third step decision. So the first requirement is that we be convinced, convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And that's how I was running the whole show, right? For years. And this is, this is like a revolutionary idea. What do you mean? Me not running my life? What do you mean? How could that, how could that not be a success, right? And it says on that basis, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. And that's kind of my experience. I really would show up to life and I'm like, I've got good motives. I just want what's best for you. I just, you isn't usually the ex, you know what I mean? Uh, but other people too, right? I, I just want what's best. I just want, I just want you to be happy. I just want this, and, right? Even with the best motives, even when I'm showing up with the most pure, the most kind, the most loving motives, I'm bouncing around and coming in collision with people. I'm coming into conflict. I'm coming into resentment. It's not working. And so now we get into one of the, like, it's such a good metaphor. So we're getting into the metaphor portion of step three. So bottom of page 60 for those that just joined us. So it says each person is like an actor. Oh, sorry, I missed the line. Uh, most people try to live by self-proportion. Now, I want to point out that's not most alcoholics. That's not most alcoholics. That is not, that's most human, everyone. Exactly, that's everyone. Most people try to live by self-will. Now, most people, they can, you know, it seems to work for them, or at least they don't experience the pain that we do. But most people live by that self-will. It's not working for us. So for us, each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. And one of the things that you can do if you're working with the sponsee or if you're reading this, you know, by yourself, you can throw your name in there. So Paige is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. Paige is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players, the rest of the actors in her own way. So we can read this whole thing through in that, in that lens of um, Paige is doing this, Paige is doing this, or like put in your own name. It's a little weird if you're reading it. I mean, you're not wrong, right? If you're reading it with like Paige is living by self-propulsion, but like it might be more effective for you if you put your own name in there. <laughs> All right. And so what this is, is ima imagine, here's the metaphor we have. Imagine we're actors in a play, right? And I, and uh, okay, so the play, the play, let's say it's Romeo and Juliet, right? And some of you might be like, dude, I don't know if you're aware, that play does not have a happy ending. I know I like the melodrama, right? And so I am in that play. Now, I like to think of Juliet. The truth of the matter is I'm tree number three, right? So I'm tree number three. I'm off in the back. I'm off in the corner. And I don't have the full script, right? I really just have my lines. And if you're wondering what my lines are, sway in the breeze. That's my lines, right? And uh, I don't know the lighting cues, right? I And... I don't, like, I've not ever gone to theater school, despite my dramatic proclivities. I've not gone to theater school. So, you know, when they have, like, uh, tape on the floor in theater, I don't know what that tape is for. I don't know if that tape means something different than that. I don't know, right? I'm off in the corner, so I don't see the whole view. I don't have the whole script. 
I don't know what the costumes are supposed to look like. I don't know what makeup is supposed to be on. I don't know the sound cues. I don't know the music. I don't know the props that are meant to be used. But I am convinced that I know how this play is supposed to go. And that's how I'm showing up to life. And so it says, if his arrangements would only stay put, if people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, our actor may sometimes be quite virtuous, right? I might do this with the best motives, the best intentions, and even do it quite kindly and generously. It says he may be even kind, considerate, patient, generous, uh, even modest and self-sacrificing. Now, if you read that with patient, you know, like Paige, maybe kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest or, and self-sacrificing. <gasps> yes, thank you. How did you know? On the other hand, also Paige, <laughs> he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest, right? But as with most humans, he's more likely to have varied traits. I don't know about you, but my experience is I'll start with the top part of that paragraph. I'll start being kind and virtuous and, you know, because I, I want you to like me. You know what I mean? I, 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 don't, want, I don't want you to hate me. So I'm going to do it nicely. And then when you don't do what I want, I'm going to cop a resentment or two. And then I'm going to try some of those, you know, more direct tactics. And so that's what that's what's happening in this metaphor. I'm tree number three, and and I'm trying to direct the the show, and I'm trying to get the people to stand where I think they should stand and do what they think they should do. And they're like, "Dude, don't tell me what to do. I'm tree number three. You're tree number three. Get off my back. I I have script and I have lines. Let me do what my own thing." And I'm like, "No, do it my way, right?" And it says what usually happens, and this is the consequence of me acting in self will. The show doesn't come off very well. He begins to let, think life doesn't treat him right. It's not my experience that I've shown up with self-pity and things feel unfair, right? He decides to exert himself more. So what I'm trying to do is, is exert self upon self. And you might be aware that that's not going to work. I have this, um, I know I'm in the middle of the actor metaphor, but I, I have this other metaphor. Um, it's not as good as the actor and director, but um, if you've ever had uh, like kids that are a little bit different in ages, or you're a sibling and, and you have older uh, siblings or younger siblings, you, you would have experienced this if you're in a generation that grew up with video games. So the older sibling will be playing the video game, right? And they'll be like playing and having a good time. And the little sibling will be coming up and they'll want to play too. And what will the older sibling do? They will give them a controller that's not plugged in. And that is me trying to exert self and exert more self upon self. See, I'm playing with an unplugged in controller and I am really going like I'm pushing those buttons. I'm exerting a lot of self and, and it doesn't seem to be working. The world doesn't seem to be responding. And my controller, it's, it's not plugged in. And that's why. So um, the show doesn't come off very well. So I'm showing up with that self-pity. And so I become on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. So I'm showing up with more of that self and it doesn't work. Still the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, a little bit of humility, right? He is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. Has that not been my experience? And it says, what is his basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker, even when trying to be kind? And uh, if you've ever heard, and like I, for a long time, I would have told you, I'd, I'd say, listen, I'm a people pleaser. I'm a people pleaser, right? That's not true. Because if I were a people pleaser, I would care if you were pleased. That is not my experience. What do I care? I care if you like me. So that's what it's talking about there. I'm really a self-seeker. I'm seeking your worth, your validation, your approval, your affection, your attention. I'm seeking that from you, even when trying to be kind. That's what we're talking about. 
And it, he says, is he not a victim of the delusion? And when we spoke of the word delusion, especially in step one, we're talking about that insanity, right? That I can't see reality as it really is that delusion that he can rest, notice with the W, rest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well. Rest with the W means to take by force. It's sort of that root word of the word wrestle. So imagine like, I am going to wrestle satisfaction and happiness out of this world. And I'm gonna manage well, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna be happy and satisfied. We gotta get an indication that that's probably not gonna go anywhere. Yeah, I can't put happiness and satisfaction in a headlock, I can't. Um, and so what I need to do, what I really need to do is rest with an R, right? Not with a W, rest with an R. And I let God take care of those things, okay? Um, I have a sponsee that, that loves the idea, like um, she loves like lazy rivers, you know, where it's like you, you're on the inner tube and you're, you're just going down. Welcome, glad you're here We're on page 61. Uh, and she loves that idea of being on inner tubes. What a weird time to come. <laughs> Just relaxing on the water. And that's what we're trying to do. I'm not taking happiness and satisfaction by force. I'm letting go and I'm being carried. That's what we're going to decide to do. Um, and it says, uh, so we're in the uh, middle paragraph right after, um, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? It says, is it not evident to the rest of the players that these are the things he wants? Can't you see? I want what I want and I want it now and I think I know it's best for you, right? Could you please respond in kind? And this is how we are perceived by others when I show up in self and self-will. And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Is that not my experience? Right, I'm, I'm, I'm tree number three and I'm telling people where to stand and I don't see the whole stage. And I'm saying, listen, I, I think I think what we need is some alt polka music. That's the music that we need for Romeo and Juliet, right? And people are like, Paige, no. And I'm like, trust me, it'll be great. Um, you can tell I'm not musically inclined. Um, you know, and, and I'm I'm showing up and I've got the best motives. I want it to be a good play. And people are like, no, tree number three, get out of here. Why are you scooting your way up to center stage? And so what I'm doing in the third step is I'm deciding that I am no longer going to try to be the director, capital D, director. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let go and I'm going to follow my line. And see, when you're on stage, if you've ever been on stage in any sort of play or any sort of school pageant, you'll know that when the lights are on you, you can't see into the audience. We can't see out there. And so there's a little bit of an element of trust and faith that in that, in that audience, in, in the very center of the rows of seats is the capital D director. And that director, he's got the full script. That director knows everyone's line. That director knows what all the markings on the floor is for. That director knows the lighting cues, the sound cues. That director knows the props. That director has, has the full play. And all I'm gonna do is follow my lines. And if you remember from where we started, what were my lines? The sway and the breeze. And I love that because in step two, when we talked about, you know, a lot of our barriers was that we don't see God. I don't see God. But often what we see is the results of God. And that's such a beautiful metaphor for the wind, right? And what am I meant to do? I'm meant to be an expression of God's love and, and let that higher power work through me. And that's what I'm called to do, right? Sway in the breeze, let God work through me. So that, that's what we're talking about there. Um, and so that's what we're deciding to do and how I do that, how I let God be the director, how I stop letting go as I work these steps. That's what we're called to do. Um, 
I just I just wanted to check, make sure there wasn't a, a, like a question. So before I moved on, you can tell I do things seamlessly here. So well-oiled ship. I know the, the well-oiled machine. I just wanted to mix my metaphors. Um, all right. So our actor is self-centered, egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. Now, one of the things I want to point out for you, because when I got here, people would be like, Paige, you're an alcoholic, you're self-centered. I'm like, one, a uh, little offended, two, accurate, but I didn't realize it. See, I thought self-centered or egocentric meant that I was walking around the place thinking I am the best. You know, if you've ever seen that uh, Bart uh, Simpson's episode where Bart Simpson, he's got that pot and pan and he's hitting it and he's like, I am so great. Everybody loves me. I am so great. That's what I thought self-centered meant. That's what I thought it meant to be egocentric. And that was not my experience. I've never even really approached I am so great hitting on a drum about that. But what self-centered means or egocentric means is to be focused upon self and how I would show up to life is I hate myself. I'm such a piece of garbage. Everyone in this room hates me and, and nobody here likes me and the world would be better off without me. And all I can think about is me and me and me and none of it's good. That's what it means to be focused on self. And yes, that everybody loves me. I am so great. I'm the most amazing. That too. But I've experienced far more that other type of self-centeredness, that hating myself and centered upon self. And yeah. All right. So he is like the retired businessman who lolls in the Florida sunshine in the winter, complaining of the sad state of the nation. And one of the things that I, I love about that is, is that retired businessman. Now, the Floridians can, can let me know about how often you get sun, sunshine, because I do know you get like a 3 p.m. rainstorm every day. Um, but he's in Florida. He's retired. And he's on a beautiful beach, a tropical beach with, um, I was going to say pine trees, not those ones, uh, palm trees. And, uh, and you'll notice he's not there, right? He's on the, one of the beautiful beach and he's not there. He's in his head running through his resentments and running through if they would do it my way, everything would be great. Complaining about the way the world is going. He's not where he is. Also, this is just a random thing. If you ever wanted like a really good like stage name or drag queen name or something like that, Florida Sunshine's a good one. Welcome to the stage, our next performer, Florida Sunshine. If you, if you needed that, if you didn't, we'll move on. All right. Um, and then it says the minister who sighs over the sins of the 20th century. And so imagine it's a minister in a little church in small town USA, and they're and they're they're trying to help their congregation. Well, if you've worked on one on one with another alcoholic, we know that we have no power over their defects of character. I can't make a, a sponsee not act out on a defect any more than that minister can his uh, congregation. And so he's complaining about all of it, all of it, and there's nothing he can do. And it says politicians and reformers who are sure all will be utopia if the rest of the world only behaves. Or, uh, yeah, and so with that, um, you know how things have been um, a little heated politically over the last few years, and people have been quite angry, um, and, and I'm sure there have many been politicians or reformers who are sure, if we do it my way, but if we do it my way, the other whole half will be upset, right? That idea that my way is the only way and everyone will be happy is, we can see how crazy and insane that is. And it says, the outlaw safecracker who thinks society has wronged him. And I, and I will just point out, um, he might have been cracking safes, and that might have put him in the position to be wronged by society. You know what I mean? If I don't break into safes, I don't get in trouble for breaking into safes. And the alcoholic who has lost all and is locked up. And it says, whatever our protestations, whatever our beliefs, our ideas, our values, are not most of us concerned with ourselves. And again, it's not that I am so wonderful ourself. Ourselves is our resentments, our self-pity at ourselves. And then this is such an important paragraph. 
it says selfishness, self-centeredness. That we think the root is the root of our troubles. Selfishness, self-centeredness. See, I came here and I thought booze was the root of my troubles. I thought alcohol was my problem, right? And then, and then I learned about the nature of alcoholism and, and I learned that I have, of course, the physical allergy, but also that mental obsession. And what is fueling that mental obsession? What is fueling that insane thought that I have when I am as sober as I am today that tells me I can drink and it'll be okay? Well, what's fueling that is that spiritual malady, that pain, that way that I feel when I'm sober, that I don't fit and be okay in my own skin. And why do I feel that way? Because I'm separated from God. And if, if you know, God's not a word that you're comfortable with yet, higher power, creator, spirit of the universe, I'm separate. I have this sense of separateness. And what's cutting me off is selfishness and self-centeredness. And one of the things... This is a step seven idea, but every single defective character I have can be traced back to selfishness and self-centeredness. And how I define them as selfishness is how I act in the world. And self-centeredness is how I think and perceive the world. And so uh, kind of a metaphor or a, not a metaphor, like an analogy is like, it is selfish, selfish of me to steal your car, sleep with your husband and pee on your carpet. That's selfish. Uh, and I always make the joke, I'm just kidding. I never did any of those things. It was linoleum. <laughs> uh, so that is selfish. And then when I'm worried you don't like me, that is self-centered, right? So that's kind of the difference. Selfish, how I act, self-centered, how I think. But that cuts me off from that power, capital P, power that I need. So that is a, the root of our trouble. Now we're talking about, you know, self-proportion and self-will. And we're kind of, I use that metaphor of like, I'm playing the video game, but the controller isn't plugged in, right? And I got to trust that, that there is somebody who has the controls and they're at the helm. But I think when I'm in self-will, I think I'm running my life. I think I'm running the show. The reality is, you know, you hear the one like, stop driving the bus or who's driving the bus. I think I am. I'm not driving the bus. I am being driven. And what I am being driven by is a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. That is what is driving me. Yeah. And that is what is making the decisions, really. And it says we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. And in many ways, we're gonna, this is a step four resentment proposition. And if you want, you can make a little note to see uh, step four, column four, because we're gonna come back to this. But what I think is, I think I'm this sort of like person, I'm, I'm minding it. I'm minding at my own business. I'm just frolicking through a meadow. I say that because uh, I've argued with people about whether or not I could frolic. Turns out I can. I am wrong. I can frolic. Um, I'm frolicking through the meadow, minding my own business. And out of nowhere, somebody comes up and harms me. But invariably, invariably is almost always, I've made a decision based on self that put me in that position to be hurt. I stepped on their toes first and they retaliate and I'm resentful at their retaliation, but I cannot see that I stepped on their toes. And the four step resentment process is what will allow that to be illuminated for us. And so it says, so our troubles we think of are basically of our own making. That was news to me. I don't know about you guys. I was like, my troubles are my, no, you, no, you, you could not possibly right, be right. I must, there must be an exception, right? But so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. Also, um, if you're looking for a band name, uh, I got you covered, right? A metal band, maybe a punk rock band. Self-will run riot, yeah, right? Um, just if you need it. All right. 
and then uh, so they arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self will run riot. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that applies, though. He usually doesn't think so. I just I like pointing that out because so many times the book meets us where we're at. When I'm showing up with that today, when I'm showing up with no, that's not me. It's like yeah, we usually don't think so. And it says uh, above everything, and this is important. Above everything, so of the utmost important importance, we alcoholics must must be rid of this selfishness. Again, this selfishness, this self-centeredness, these fears, this self-pity, this is what is cutting me off from the power which is God. And that is that power that I need. So above everything, I need to be free of it. We must, or it kills us. And that's important to understand. I will drink again, right? If I do not have the ability to access that power, I will drink again. And as an alcoholic, to drink is to die. And it says God makes that possible. And in there, we can kind of see a step one, step one proposition, right? If I don't have this thing, it'll kill me. And God is the one that keeps me sober. God makes that possible. And it says there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. And that was the kicker is I cannot overcome self with self. And if we remember back in the agnostics, it's, it spoke about how many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. I want to be a good person. I don't want to hurt the people that I'm hurting. I want to live up to that ideal and I can't. And I cannot get rid of self on my own power. You know, a lot of times I, I'll, I'm like jokes, like I'm, I'm going to really work on my procrastination later, <laughs> or I'm, I'm going to really get that anger under control, right? Or like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little anxious to worry, uh, to work and worry about my anxiety. You know what I mean? Like I can't overcome it on my own. And that's the reality. And so we see that there is a deeper surrender that is needed. A deeper letting go. See, I come here and I think I got to let go of the booze. But I also come and to learn that I can't stay sober on my own power. And then I come and learn that I can't overcome self on my own power. And I'm going to be giving more and more of myself to that unconditional love, which is God. But I don't know that yet. And it said, neither could we reduce. Um, so it says many of us had moral. Uh, sorry, I missed a couple things. So God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. And so again, we're reiterating, I can't on my own, I need God. I can't on my own, I need God. And so that leads us, that is that first requirement. And now what we're coming up is the second requirement for the third step. It says, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. And so when I work with my sponsees, uh, what I do is I, I'm like, I got some good news and I got some bad news. Uh, the good news and bad news is that you're fired. You're absolutely fired from the management position of your life. Uh, and actually, one of the things I do with sponsees is I'll, I'll, I'll make them a little pink slip and I'll give it to them. And uh, just because I think that's fun and delightful. Um, and then I, I, when my sponsees over in Scotland, I give them a P45 because that's what, that's what it's called over there. So at this moment, we're officially fired from the management position of our lives. And it's a little like, hey, Paige, that might seem, that might seem a little harsh, but hold on. If we at least look at my life, in step one, I admitted my life was unmanageable. I was the one managing it. I managed my own life into an unmanageable position, right? I managed my life into bankruptcy because it was about to end. That's about as bad as you can do for life management. You know what I mean? 
I, I always make the joke. If I manage a blockbuster as poorly as I manage my life, I ought to be fired. And I use blockbuster because it's real low stakes. You know what I mean? No one's expecting it to make it. But I, I ought to be fired. I ran it to the ground. And so that's it. I am no longer in charge of my life. But somebody has to run my life. My life has to run. My life has to function. So it says next. So this is what we're going to be convinced of, right? This is another requirement. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our capital D director. So God's going to run the play. I am just going to follow my line. And here's where we're given these different ways in which we can relate to an approach, approach God, approach a higher power. It says he is the principal. We are his agents. And notice capital P principle. And so uh, when I, you know, got here, I kind of read that. I'm like, agent, agent for God, special agent page, P, P, Q, working for God. Um, that's not what that means, but I still think it's a good way to look at it. So um, an agent is somebody who is legally allowed to, to act on behalf of the principle. So a way to look at how that looks in my life is, is showing up to life knowing that I'm working for God, showing, showing up to life, knowing that I'm a, almost like a representative for God. That changes how I show up to my home group. That changes how we show up at the airport. That changes how we show up in traffic. That it changes how we show up with our family. Um, and then it says, uh, he is the capital F father, we are his children. Now, I, I just want to, you know, say I know a lot of people, we, a lot of us don't have good, or like, I don't have any relationship with, with my father. I've never met him, right? Uh, well, once or twice, but like never, never got to know him. And, and many of us have had really, really difficult relationships with maybe our mother, maybe our father, maybe our parent. And so that idea of God being the father, we being the children, it might, it might like, so we don't have to use it if it doesn't, if it doesn't resonate. But how I like to reconcile it is, is imagine, you know, just that most loving, caring parent, that ideal parent, maybe that parent that we would want to be if we have children or, or, or would uh, want to have children. You know, imagine that, you know, small child that's just having a tough day and needs consoling, you know, and I, I just, I have this, um, I have this uh, metaphor um, where it's like, I, I, for, for anyone who's uh, had kids or babysat or had nieces, I have a niece and nephew and, and they're just the best. But you'll know uh, that they'll have this, um, they'll have these days um, where they are just on your nerve all day. You got one nerve, they're on it all day. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, it doesn't matter whether two or 22. You know what I mean? They're just driving you nuts and you can't stand it. And you just, they just go to bed, go to bed. And they finally get them to bed, you know, after getting them all the water and all the, you know, stories and all the stuff that matter, they're two or 22. Uh, and they finally get them to bed. And then you sit down and, and you're in that quiet of the house and, and peace. And for a little while, not very long, you miss them. And so many parents will go and, and open the door to the kids' room and just, just watch them with love because they miss them. And so if we if we don't like that metaphor, we don't have to use it. But imagine the most loving, like where we would turn to for comfort and guidance and support. Where would we turn? And, and that sort of way of relating to a power greater than ourselves. It says, so that is, so what we're going to do is we're going to let God be God in our lives. We're going to let God run our lives. And it says, most good ideas are simple. And this concept, this idea was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. And if you look at an archway, the keystone is that stone that's right at the center of the arch. And that's that stone that holds all the tension. So this third step decision that we're making, where I'm not running the show, and I'm going to let God be God in my life. That is the idea that holds all the tension of this program. 
And when we make this decision, we're going to see how many times in the book it calls back to this third step decision. And I, I just want to point out where we are passing is to freedom, right? I spoke last week about how the third step, it feels like I'm on the edge of a cliff. I'm on this precipice of change. And what I'm doing is taking this leap of faith. And I don't know where I'm going to end up. I don't know how it's going to go. But really, what it is, is, is to freedom, is to peace, is to serenity. You know, in the third step, um, it says we, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, right? Care. And in, in the third step in this moment, I don't know if my will and my life will be cared for. But imagine those things in our lives that we've cared for, that love, that attention, care. And see, one of those things is when we go through the book and we'll read through all the promises. Heck, we're going to read some promises here in just a little bit. When I read through those promises, those become evidence of care. And deeper, always deeper than that, when I experience those promises in my life, that becomes proof of God's care for my will in my life. And keep in mind, my will in my life was in a dumpster and it was on fire and it was going off a different cliff. You know what I mean? Nobody could manage my will in my life worse than me. Nobody. I, the meanest to me, I hated myself constantly trying to, you know, honestly end my own life more times than I should count or could count, I think, you know? And so here's the thing. We got fired. We have a new manager for life, but we can't stay spiritually unemployed, right? I need a spiritual job. I need to go to work. So it says when we sincerely took such a position, so what we're going to do is now orientate ourselves to working for God. And, and the, those orientations of God is the father, I am the child. God is the principal, I am the agent. God is the capital D, director, I am the actor, right? that orientation it says when we sincerely so actually followed this up with action right all sorts of remarkable things followed we had a new capital e employer and so this what we're seeing here is our employment contract again i'm i'm really i'm really a lot of fun we right got an employment contract Ooh, contract and actually, not only will I give my sponsees the pink slip, I will give them uh, uh, the employment contract for them if they want to sign it. And so it says, this is it. It says, being all powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. That's the employment contract. And so I want to point out, like, when you get a new, when you get a new job, um, you sign that employment contract, right? You go through the interview process. We did that in step two, right? Uh, we, you know, go through that interview process and, and we have that employment contract. And, and in that employment contract, there's some things. So it'll, it'll have some uh, requirements for me as an employee, right? I'll have to show up to my shifts. I'll have to, you know, uh, do my job, right? I'll have to, uh, you know, just what's in the scope of my work and responsibilities, right? So that's part of the employment contract. Now, the other part of the employment contract is the exciting stuff, is the wages, you know, whether it's hourly or salary, we got the benefits. I'm, I'm at a time in my life where I'm like, ooh, dental and, and uh, vision care, ooh, benefits, you know, right? Uh, and the vacation days, retirements, Stuff, you know, that's in the employment contract. And we see that here as well. So he provided what we needed. And that is, is God's end of the employment contract. I will be given everything, everything that I need. I will point out what I need and what I want are very different and often do not coincide. I have a, I have a friend who, uh, she, what she'll say is like, Ooh, didn't know you needed that. Ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, um, so that is what is given to me. And here's what is asked of me. It says, if we keep close to him and perform his work well. Well, how do I keep close to God? Well, first and foremost, 
I work these steps like my life depends on it. I dive into that inventory process. I dive into that fourth step and I work these steps. And of course it's prayer and of course it's meditation. Of course it's inventory. Of course it's amends. That is what I do. That is how we keep close to God. And it says, and perform his work well. Well, what is God's work for somebody like me? It's probably as simply as, and I believe it was Dr. Bob that said it, love and service, love and service. God's work for somebody like me is to show up into the world and be of love and service. And of course, to everyone that I may come in contact with, but, but also very specifically, alcoholics. Very specifically, people who have suffered in the way I've suffered because I have been created. I've been made to work with them and to help them. So what do I need to do? I need to work these steps like my life depends on it and carry this message to others. And in so doing, God will give me everything that I need. And what comes from this is the step three promises. And these are the promises that come true when we follow up this third step decision with action. So it established on such a footing. And that's the thing I love. There's promises as on all over this book established on such a footing, the footing of I am going to go out here and work for God. Again, what does that mean? I'm working these steps. I'm making my amends. I'm carrying this message to others. That is the footing established on such a footing. We became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. I have a sponsee who sent me a meme that was like, why would we want to be less interested in our little plans and designs, right? But the truth is that never got me anywhere. I was just misery and suffering. And I know when I focus on myself, there's, there's really never, never been freedom in it. Here's where the freedom comes. It says more and more we became interested in seeing what, what we could contribute to life, what we can give. And it says, as we felt new power flow in, I needed that in step one. I, I admitted I was powerless in step two. I needed that power. Following this decision up with action, that power flows in. As we enjoyed peace of mind, enjoyed peace of mind. When I got here, peace of mind was I, like I knew what it meant intellectually. I don't know if I'd ever experienced it to enjoy peace of mind. As we discovered we could face life successfully, again, that was something I felt I could never do. As we became conscious of his presence, beginning to have that knowing relationship with a power greater than ourselves, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. That is what can happen. I sincerely show up to life in this way, if I sincerely show up and follow this third step decision with action. See, if I make this third step decision, but I, I don't follow it up with action, I'm not going anywhere, right? I'm stuck here, right? When I was asked, hey, will you come to Fort McMurray? And I said, yes. If I didn't help get a ticket booked, if I didn't get to the airport, if I didn't get through security, if I didn't get on the plane, I'd be right here right now, right? I need to follow it up with action. And that's how we know we've made the third step decision because we're working the rest of the steps. So it says we're now at step three. So we're now willing to seal that decision, to make that decision. And, and in many ways, that third step prayer, I, I see it like, a, like signing the employment contract, right? Again, I'm, I'm really fun. Uh, I'm one of those people that will talk for hours about stationery. Me, you know, yeah. So I will not be the, the lead singer of uh, self-woo, red riot, woo, you know, or, or on stage as Miss Florida Sunshine. But, but I, I, I will tell you which brand of highlighters I think are great. Uh, so we're signing that contract and it says, God, I offer my, so I'll read it and then I'll break it down. God, I offer myself to thee, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. Of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life, 
may I do thy will always. And so in this prayer, what we're seeing is we're, it says, God, I offer myself to thee. God, I'm giving me you. Take me. And it says to build with and do, do with me as thou wilt. Because me building and doing what I want with my life wasn't working. So God, you, you take that, right? And it says, relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. That bondage of self, that is that self-pity. That is that pain. That I mean, that is what was killing me, killing me sober, bondage of self. And that line, relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. It's one line that in many ways encapsulates our whole program. Free me from, from me and my selfish, my self-centeredness so I can do your will. And we'll notice that these aren't, these aren't just like gimme, gimme prayers, right? It's I'm asking to be freed from the bondage of self, not because the bondage of self sucks and it's painful and it's awful and I'm dying behind it. No, relieve me of it so I can better do your will. Give me this freedom so I can work for you. It says, take away my difficulties. Again, we'll see that it's not take away my difficulties because they're difficult, difficult, lemon, difficult as opposed to easy breezy love and squeezy right not because they're difficult not because they're hurting me relieve me of of these difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those i would help take this from me get me through this difficulty so that i can help others that's what this is about that i would help of thy power i want to point out capital t capital p Capital T, capital L, thy love, capital T, capital W, thy way of life, right? And again, if I don't like that word, God, I see those capitals. Those are synonyms that I can use. And, and again, I want to point out that this is the way of life. I'm making this decision. I'm not, I'm not done. I'm never done. I continue. I continue to grow in this work and control, grow in these steps. It's, it is a way of life. And it says, may I do thy will always. You know, and one of the things, um, this prayer, uh, I just kind of want to share this with you guys real quick. Um, it's a beautiful prayer. And it's a beautiful prayer that we can use in our daily life. But one of the things, when I, when I have found that I'm in obsession about something, like I'm worrying about something, I'm worried about someone, I do what's called a modified third step prayer. And so let's say, um, let's say I'm worried about my ex, you know, in one way or another, I'm ruminating or what have you. What I can say is, God, I offer my ex to you to build with and do with as thou wilt. And then I come back to the prayer to me, relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. And I take it through. Again, let's say I was worried about this big book study that I'm doing, right? God, I offer this big book study to you to build with and do with as thou wilt and relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties and I can take that prayer through. It's just something that I found helpful. I share with sponsees, so I want to share with you guys. And so that is the, the signing or the sealing of, of that contract. And it says, we thought well before taking this step, making sure that we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. Remember that prayer and how it works. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. It's that leap of faith, right? Abandon, to let go, to dive in, right? To dive into this work and this way of life. And it says, we found it very, very desirable to take this step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. And, uh, you know, we can, I do it with my sponsees. And actually, when I, when and I read through this with my sponsees, how I read it is, we found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person. That's me. Such as our wife, that's not me. Best friend, that doesn't need to be me. Or spiritual advisor, that's me again. <laughs> but it is better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. That's not me. I won't, I know what we're, not misunderstanding. And, uh, and so I, I, you know, sponsees, we, we do it together. And, and something my home group does is after the meeting, if anyone wants to come and, and do the third step, uh, there's a back room and, and we go into the back room and uh, 
they, they'll get on, well, well, not me, I won't get on my knees, but every, everyone else. Um, I, I'm in a wheelchair, if you guys didn't know, I just thought I should point that out, like, as if I'm like, no, I'm, I'm Captain Special or something. <laughs> everyone else gets on their knees and Princess Faye just doing what she wants. No, no, I'm disabled. I thought I'd just qualify that for you guys. Uh, for those who didn't know or haven't seen me from the waist down. Uh, so we, we get down on our knees, I don't. Um, and uh, we'll say the third step prayer together in a group. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, it's a powerful thing. And, and uh, you know, before, uh, I mostly work with sponsors kind of online, but before, um, before COVID, before Zoom was quite, quite the thing, I mean, I've done third step with sponsors and coffee shops and parking lots all over. You can third step all over. And I had sponsors that were like, oh, are people watching us? We weren't that concerned when we were dancing topless on tables is all I'm saying, you know what I mean? I wasn't worried about the audience. And, and I will point out, I'm sure they've seen weirder things than people saying a quick prayer in a coffee shop. So, um, and so it says the wording was, of course, quite optional, so long as we express the idea, voicing it without reservation. And uh, and that's the and that's the thing is, if I don't like the third step prayer, I can write my own. And one of the things that I do with sponsees, and and we do that at uh, at my home group as well, where they'll come up with a, a prayer in their own words. And uh, I really like to do that. And, and I'm big with my sponsees. I'm not going to ask you to do something I haven't done or that I'm not actively doing. You know what I mean? So I'll start with them. And I'll say, like, listen, what I would like you to do is, is come up with a prayer in your own words. You can write it down if you want. If, if you speak another language, heck, use another language. I don't mind, you know, um, but come up with it in your own words. And you can't do it wrong. But to, but to uh, sort of help them take that leap of faith, I, I always offer, I'll do it first if you would like. And the reason why is, is why I've, I've gotten the habit of doing that with spot seeds, because it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's a little bit awkward. It's a little bit uncomfortable. And it's a little bit of a leap of faith. And so I, when I was in my early sobriety, I, I had a friend uh, who would always say, Paige, everything you want in life was outside of your comfort zone. And I would tell him, well, I wouldn't tell him this because I'm not socializing and socializing with honesty is not something I'm doing. Uh, but I, I would I would internally be like, absolutely not, mister. Absolutely not. You're dead wrong. Uh, no, everything I want is my comfort zone. I want to stay here. It's comfy. I do not know. I'm good. But what I didn't realize is every time that I take a little leap of faith outside of that comfort zone, I build trust and faith in my higher power. And every time I take that little leap of faith outside of that comfort zone, over time, that comfort zone grows. And my comfort zone is, is far more roomy and comfortable than it was when I got here. And so one of the reasons why this, you don't have to do that with your sponsees. I'm just sharing it. But one of the reasons I do is because when we put pen to paper on their fourth step, and there might be a little worried or might be a little scared. Well, they have that experience of doing something a little uncomfy and a little scary and it being okay. And I've heard, so I couldn't count how many, you know, third steps people have shared that I've heard and no one's ever done it wrong. And, and I really mean that. You can't do it wrong. And it says, this was only a beginning. And that's what this is. Just a beginning. If I do not follow this up with action, I will drink again. And so this was only a beginning, though if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a very great one, was felt at once. And so we'll leave it there and, and pick up next week as we launch into that fourth step. Next we launched next week. All right.